Welcome to Frank Stiano Explains and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. In this video we're going to have a look at some sorting algorithms that beginners often reinvent. The running time of these algorithms is quadratic in the number of elements that are being sorted, so we know from last time that uh, this is strictly worse than the best we could possibly achieve. So we won't spend very much time on them, but each of them illustrates a particular point uh, and it's worth knowing about them, if nothing else, so you can recognize them and suggest something better if someone wants to use them for anything serious. So this first, uh, first uh, thing I said, select sort, is in fact a perfectly legitimate uh, sorting algorithm. Uh, I don't think I need to uh, run it here again, uh, but again the idea is what should be in this place? Well the smallest of all these. So I look for the smallest, uh, it's here, and then I swap it with whoever was taking its place here. And then this one's done, I don't need to uh, think about this anymore. This one's done. And in here, who should be in here? Well the smallest of all the ones in here and the smallest is, the smallest is this one, all right? And then I take it here, uh, and this one is now done, and so on. And so I have, similarly to insert sort, I have a, a big loop which moves by one uh, every time scanning all the positions, and the invariant is that the stuff that's uh, to the left of i has already been sorted, I don't need to touch it anymore. And uh, I do fewer swaps in this case than I do with insert sort, uh, but I have to do a bunch of comparisons to find out where my uh, minimum is, because here I have to look at all of them uh, and comparing with the one where I want to put and see which one, um, which one should be promoted to that position. So this legitimately should be here. Okay, so that's select sort, for which uh, you have a listing like this in your handout. So that's great for uh, minimizing swaps, but it, it, it's not so great for the number of comparisons, because uh, every time it looks at all the other elements uh, to my right, oops, and so again, uh, that's a linear number of swaps, but a quadratic number of comparisons. If I wanted to reduce the number of comparisons, then uh, I could revisit the insert sort, but say, well, when I insert, instead of going down, so insert sort would take, um, imagine that I am somewhere here, and so this one would have to be like this. Imagine I'm here for insert sort, um, then uh, imagine I'm here. This one, I would have to compare it with this, or with this, with this, with this, until I get to here, doing swaps along the way. Wouldn't it be nicer if I did a binary version of this comparison and checked it against the middle, so uh, should it go should it go this way or this way? And then I decide it goes this way, and then I check it against the middle. Should it go this way or this way? And then by bisecting every time, I do many fewer uh, comparisons. Instead of doing the number of comparisons that's proportional to the size of this, I do a number of comparisons that's proportional to the logarithm of the size of this. So that is nice and will uh, indeed reduce the number of comparisons to n log n. Unfortunately, uh, when I decide that this one has to end up here, then I have to move all of these here. And so imagine this was the first one, I would have moved uh, all of them by one. So this would have uh, a number of swaps, which um, is proportional to the size of this. And if I uh, consider the outer loop of i that is moving over all of them, I end up again with a triangular number, and so a quadratic number of swaps as the price for having 
an n log n number of comparisons. That's for uh, the binary insert sort. Binary insert sort. So this uh, listing in the handout is incomplete, and it would do you some good if instead of just reading stuff, you uh, wrote the binary partitioning part of this algorithm. Um, what else have we got in here? Oh, bubble sort. OK, bubble sort uh, is an algorithm that uh, people often rediscover if they haven't been to an algorithms course. Uh, and uh, it's simply the idea that you could have a pass, again, pass over the array. Uh, and any time you find things that are out of order, well, everything's in order here, looks great. Uh, until here, these two are out of order, and then you would swap them because they're out of order. Uh, and what you would do is you would keep yourself some Boolean that says, did some swaps in this pass. Is it true or false? Well, when I start, let me just mess it up. What did I have at the beginning? Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, what did I say the mass? Not that it matters, but uh, just for consistency. So I have my Boolean here. Did I do swaps in this pass? No, I haven't even started. Uh, so I go around and I say, this one and its successor, are they in the right order? No, then I need to swap them. And as I do that, I have to set my Boolean to true. I did some swaps. So this one and its successor, they're fine. This one and its successor, they're fine. This one and this one, ah, I need to swap. But this one's already been highlighted here, so that's OK, uh, and so on. These ones need to be swapped, uh, and these ones need to be swapped. And then I start again. And then I do another pass, and these ones are now OK because I fixed them earlier. So now, for this pass, I haven't done any swaps yet. Don't need to. And these two, I need to swap. So, ah, too bad. Like this. And I keep going. And you can see that you have basically two kinds of situations. Uh, one where you get a big number, a big number here, and then it keeps riding the wave of this i, uh, and it gets taken to the end. And the other case is where you have a small number that should be, uh, should be further along to the left. And then he will do one hop only for one pass. And he has to do another hop in the next pass, another hop in the next pass. And so he takes as many outer loop uh, passes as there are missing positions between it and where it needs to be. Uh, but there's an exercise in your handout to say that it won't take more than n uh, passes of the big loop to fix everything. Uh, and notice that after you fix everything, you will still need to do one more pass of this uh, to check that you have at least one pass where you don't do any swaps. That's your telltale sign that you have finally sorted. So it looks unnecessary if you're a human because you see it's already sorted. But if you're a computer, you don't know it's sorted until you do one pass without swaps. So but again, uh, this ends up being uh, what cost. Uh, the cost uh, would end up being quadratic uh, for the reason we said. And so it's no better than any of the other stuff that uh, we've seen in the worst case. In the worst case, but actually in the, in the best case for this algorithm, if you give it an already sorted input, then in just one pass, big O of n, you can tell that it's already sorted. You don't have to do any work. It's not the case for every algorithm. For example, if you check the select sort, then you can see that uh, in the case of the 
uh, select sort. Um, where was I? So for select sort, even if I get a completely sorted input, uh, over here I have to do one pass over every position. And for every position, I have to look for the minimum everywhere. And even if, if the minimum of the rest is exactly here, I still have to check all the others in case something even smaller was over there, which I don't know a priori. And so I will lose uh, big O of n square even if I have a sorted input. So it's a, it's a useful thing of bubble sort that in the case of sorted input, it doesn't spend as much time. 